And a good Sunday evening to you and a very happy Father's Day to all South Jersey dads and dads far and wide, including this guy sitting next to me, father of three, Tom Heist. Good to see How you. How are you, Dan? Good to see you. And thanks for Terrific. kind of coming in on a holiday. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, I know you guys had a nice uh, family breakfast with the kids. Yes, we did. Some yummy pancakes and syrup. One of my favorites. Nice. And we brought dads. Oh, you know, Mom had a 57 degree rainy day back in May for Mother's Day. Dad's kind of fared a little bit better today with all the sunshine, Absolutely right? Absolutely. Beautiful day. Yeah, beautiful day. Uh, Co-host Paul McCarty, who's normally here, sitting to your left, stage right, looking at it from your direction, guys. Uh, she is a little under the weather, to use a, uh, <laughs> uh, a <laughs> business pun, but I'm forecasting her to be right back in that chair next week. So uh, join us and uh, wishing Palma well. Hopefully she's feeling better and we'll be back next week. This is Tidal Flooding Talk, 7 p.m. every Sunday evening. It used to be Tuesdays, now it's Sundays. So, yep. you know, sitcoms have done it, so we should be able to do it successfully. We shouldn't die. Right? We shouldn't die. No, yeah. So <laughs> day change and uh, you can come on down here to the pub as always. Uh, join us for food and drink and join the conversation live or join it on Facebook as well. Feel free to post your questions and comments. And as a meteorologist, I always ad lib. Pom is the prepared one. So without Pom here today, we're both going to be right. ad libbing. But there's so many ad-lib. topics to discuss. There really are. Uh, about tidal flooding. One of the first ones I want to discuss, just because I noticed. Friday night, there was actually a little bit of tidal flooding along the shore. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a coastal flood advisory, minor stuff, but we're now getting the time of year where there's a lot of seasonal residents down. Absolutely. Whether it be you know second homeowners or whether it be tourists, mm-hmm. and you know when there's a major storm coming like a hurricane and there's an evacuation order, all right, fine, it's not a problem. But I have seen living in Ocean City, a lot of tourists lose their cars yes. um, when good. tidal flooding. Now, tidal flooding is a lot less common in the summer, yeah. but it does happen. And when you have a significant flooding event, tourists, to no fault of their own, are just a little less aware of how tidal flooding works. So I guess my first question is to you is, how do we change that? Well, uh, communication is the key. Um, I think uh, most towns have billboards. You know, that to warn people. Uh, or actually, the billboards are there to just announce uh, different venues. Uh, you know, where direct people to the beach, what entertainment's taking place. You know, they might want to put a, a little warning that tides could be higher, including uh, water on the street. I guess that's one way of doing it. Um, we send a lot of communication out to our clients uh, via email, via uh, uh, text alerts. So I think the communication piece is getting better and better. Uh, I'm not sure it's quite there in terms of being able to reach the day visitor. Right. You know, who's coming in to spend a day at the beach. And I think one of the challenges, too, is is teaching them, all right, you know, tidal flooding is going to occur. Where are safe places to park? Because, you know, locals right. know, all right, moderate flood is coming up. I'm not going to park on Haven and Ocean City. I'm not going to park on, you know, this street in Margate or this street in Wildwood. But, but again, tourists, not through, you know, they're not at fault just because they don't live here. They may not be aware of, all right, where is a safe place to park? Right. And most so, towns are getting better at, and better at fixing the, the, the daytime flooding problem, you know, from the rain and from the, the small tidal events. Uh, the drainage is improving, the pumping stations are improving. I know that most communities have major projects uh, at work right now. They do, and, and it's something that we're getting better, and I think a lot of the nuisance stuff we're getting better at, but as we've talked about on past shows, it's something that will never totally go away, because especially the bigger events, you know, the nor'easters right. and the hurricanes, not going to go away. We are now in hurricane season. Uh, you know, June 1st it begins. Yes, we are. We know in South Jersey that hurricane season, you know, our prime, I always say, is August 15th to October 15th. But, of course, you can get storms outside that range. You really can, yes. And you have to be ready the whole season. So what's something as hurricane season starts that coastal residents, both the year-round and the seasonal residents, what's something we should do? you know, at the start of hurricane season? Or is it something that we should do year-round? Well, you know, you, you, a lot of people live at the shore. They're not here all week long. So I would just say put away your furniture that's on your porch or put away the things that can blow around outside of your home. You know, when you leave for, for the week to go back to your Pennsylvania home, 
put those things in the garage or put them in the house. Because when the winds kick up, the next thing you know, that chair is tumbling down the road right. and it can actually go through a window, you know, of your neighbor's property. So I think that's one thing you can do is, is kind of kind of prepare thinking when you're not there, something bad can happen. And we've seen that not necessarily with flooding events, but with like these at high wind events, but I guess you should always have your property ready, yeah. you know, for whatever Mother Nature throws at you. Yeah, and have a, you know, have a plan, you know, have uh, the batteries, the flashlights, you know, the canned foods, the water, those things in your home. And really, if you're in your home, be ready to go. You, you know, in the old days, people had this idea that they're going to ride out the storm. Um, I don't think that's such a great idea anymore. You know, when, when the city officials say it's time to go, you really should leave. There's yep. no really good reason to stay in your house um, because only bad things can happen. And how do you, you know, because mer meteorologists and emergency managers, and this is a topic we've addressed on past shows, you want 100% participation with an evacuation order. But you don't get that. In fact, we had a higher evacuation rate in Irene, which wasn't bad, right. than we did in Sandy, which was bad. Right. So, I mean, it, it's it's more of a problem for emergency managers to solve. But from your point of view, is there is there a way we can increase? I, I think one way we increase is have people stay, let them see the fury of a storm, yeah. and then they'll never stay again. Yeah, exactly. But obviously, that's not what we recommend. You know what happened? You know, last year we had that big warning that the storm was coming, and a lot of people left, and the storm kind of blew over, and we didn't have it. So then people were like, well, well, why would we ever listen to you know? Obviously, uh, weather forecasts can be wrong. They're they're a forecast. You're never going to be 100 percent right. accurate. Um, but I, there's really no good reason to stay for any storm. Right. Um, you're never going to hold your home together. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, and I've heard really some horror stories of people who did stay, and the water's coming into their living rooms, and the, the outlets are starting to short. And you know, there's and by at a certain point, emergency managers can't go. Emergency first responders can't. can't go out and get you anyway. And unfortunately, you said you know weather forecasts, and, and, I, and I have a little of experience with this, and. It's kind of a situation where you're only as good as your last forecast because yeah. if you cry wolf and nothing happens, people don't believe you the next time. Even though yeah. it's a totally different storm, yeah. people will not believe you the next time. I remember, you know, one time I forecast 30 inches of snow and we got like, you know, that much. <laughs> right. So the next time we were forecasting snow, no one believed you. And, right. and the same thing with coastal storms. So, it's a guess. so yeah, it is a guess, but yeah, every storm is different and you should not base what you do evacuation wise based on what happened with the last storm because the next storm is going to be completely different. Exactly. Yeah. And the other thing that people can do, that, not that really the day visitor, but the people that are here, you know, they should just walk around their home, look for areas uh, where the flashing is kind of coming off the home, they nail it back in. To look at, stand back on the street and look at your roof or have someone go up occasionally. Get those loose roof shingles nailed down because uh, when your home is secure, you're really going to prevent that damage a lot better than if you're kind of going into a storm with kind of a, a shoddy, you know, or a home that needs repair. Right. Right. So always keep your home uh, totally up to date. Now, with, with fl tidal flooding, back on this for a second, yeah. do you see in your business, do you see a lot of tidal flooding, like, like cars we damaged do. by tidal flooding? Yeah, now, we do. Now, is it a year-round thing, or is it a uh, you know major event spike? I would say now it's more uh, major events. and you know, But major events, you know, what's a major event today? Um, you know, we, we get that a couple weeks ago, we had a really high tide, and we had, I'd say, 10 auto claims of water going into, the, into people's cars. Um, and normally it's the people who are either day visitors or have just moved into the area and they really aren't aware that, hey, outside of their house, the water can, can kind of come up in, into their car. So anyone who's new into the area, talk to your neighbor. You know, where, if there's a, a storm, where do you park? Do you go to the uh, supermarket? Do you go to the ball field? Do you, do you leave? Do you leave the town? So I would say for all people who are kind of new into an area, figure out where you want to take your home. Know that before the storm arrives. The last thing you want to do is figure that out while, you know, it's kind of happening. And I, and I think it's good because we use those terms minor, moderate, major, and, and yeah. record when it comes to flooding. And based on the title flooding that's forecast, all right, if it's minor, I'm going to park my car on 1st Street. If it's moderate, no, no, 1st isn't good. i, I got to go all the way up to 4th Street. And, and I think that's good to have 
uh, idea of where to put your car with each level of yes. storm that happens out there. Yeah, but, but what we are, we do see, we see the uh, flooding events in the cars. Uh, a lot of the low-lying homes will have uh, floodwaters every few years. There's 30,000 properties in this country that have had five flood claims or more. So there's a lot of low-lying homes where the water just kind of just keeps washing in and washing. Now, obviously those numbers are declining because the government has provided a lot of money to tear the home down or elevate it. But there's still a lot of homes out there. And if, you have, if you're a new renter to a house like that, you might not know uh, that your home is susceptible to flooding. If you can walk from your sidewalk into your home, it's not an elevated home and you potentially could have water. But the onus is on the renter or the visitor or the tourist to kind of do the research because it's not really up bit. to the realtor to say, all right, this is going to flood. It's, I mean, they're no. trying to make the sales. Yes. So, so, and it's not going to yeah. be, so it's up to you to check with your neighbors, like you said, uh, right. you know, to do a little bit of digging and research. I mean, if the weather's sunny and dry all week, fine, right. no problem. But if there's any bad weather coming or flooding coming, I mean, you're on vacation, kind of, but you still got to do a little bit of you do have a little due diligence. Yeah, yeah, you can't turn your head off completely. You got to be kind of thinking your way through it. What's your biggest um, flooding memory? Uh, oh, being an Ocean City wow. resident and, uh, and and business person for how many years now? Uh, oh, let's go resident well, about first. thirty years. Okay. Uh, I've been in business uh, at the Thomas Heist Insurance Agency. I've been here essentially all my life. Okay. I, I came to the shore when I was two, and I'm fifty-ish. Right. So, so, so I guess you know. I, I like to ask that question. What's what's the biggest thing that sticks out of you? Is it recent or is it well? It's funny. Out? When I was uh, probably twelve or fifteen, we had a storm, a, a, a hurricane, and I don't think it hit us directly. I know it didn't hit us directly, but my father, uh, we my, decided to stay. You know, we were stayers. We weren't uh, leaving. Of course, the back then too, the I mean, mandatory evacuations may not have been as you know prominent right. and pronounced they as they are now so okay. so i think i was 12 years old and i told them i wanted to go out in the storm and they tied a rope around me and i remember walking outside and holding on to the rope to see if the winds would blow me down the street so that was kind of my first memory of a storm and did they no, no <laughs> which is a good thing they probably would not have let me outside if the right. winds were blowing right. that hard um but when superstorm sandy hit i did leave and uh we have a ground floor a garage, an elevator, and I had uh, cameras uh, on the elevator, and I was we, we were in Philadelphia, and I was watching the waters rise in the outside of the garage and come into the, the elevator lobby and kind of coming up the wall, and I'm watching all this happen, and all of a sudden, the camera turns off. We lose our power, and it goes blank. And I literally thought, our building is gone. <laughs> you know, it's it. It's going to burn to the ground or something awful. And I came back about four days later, and we had about four foot of water in our garage area, and the, the bay mud was in inside of the uh, the building, and it was just amazing. So um, we have another office in Margate, and I said, Margate's got to be gone because it's one of those situations where you walk off of the sidewalk into the building, and I walked in, and there wasn't a drop of damage. Uh, so it, it goes to show some areas you can have high water, and other areas it drains well. And, and it shows you island to island is different, storm really to storm is. is different. I mean, you could have something like leaves clog in a storm drain, like during one storm and not exactly. another, that can totally throw. So not every flooding situation is the same, and you know every every situation is different. Yeah, the Sandy event really changed my life because of the uh, amount of damage and the number of people and families affected by Sandy. It's really a, a difficult time to watch people lose their homes and kind of go through that process of trying to rebuild. Um, but we've gotten there and in how, most cases. How taxing was it on like insurance agents after after a major storm? Uh, it's emotional. We had uh, three employees who personally lost homes and we're asking all of our employees to work very long hours and taking claims. So emotionally, it was about a year's time where we were able to finally take a deep breath and say, I think we're through this. But, you know, it's just it's a tough time. It really was. But your building uh, in Ocean City is raised. It's and it's just, just the garage. Yep. So you guys did things right when you when you built that or when we you did. moved there. Yeah. Did you have it built? or did you We did. We had that okay. building built for us. And, and we had the parking underneath and the office space above, which was a great idea. When they first built the building, they actually built it. And I walked into the elevator machinery room and all the machinery sitting on the ground. And I said... Uh, why is the machinery on the ground? 
Well, this is how we do it. I said, it's got to be up in the air. So they said, it's going to cost you another three or $4,000. I said, well, I got to spend the money. Well, the sandy water came and within one inch of the elevator machinery. I, I was so happy that we had elevated it, like literally four feet in the air. And it, it was not damaged. And that would have been another probably ten or $15,000 worth of damage. And that's why you see most homes have, you know, air conditioners, heaters, any, yes. any big expensive units are elevated, or at least yes. should be elevated. And really, FEMA requires that. So if you, are, you buy a new home and you uh, walk around and you see your condenser out in the yard, um, number one, your home's not in compliance. Right. And number two, if you elevate that air conditioner condenser to the same height as your living space, you're going to save a lot of money on your flood policy. Yeah. So not I, I, there's less and less of those problems out there, but there's still a few. So you know that's one of the simple recommendations: is where's your air conditioning condenser? Is it on the ground? Elevate it. Right. Um, you were talking off air before the show about the uh, the uh, anticipated upcoming renewal of the uh, National Flood Insurance Program. Yes. Want to give us a little bit of an update on that? I can. Um, it was supposed to renew back in September of last year, um, and we've gone through a series of uh, temporary renewals, which is basically just saying we're going to renew it for another 60 days. Um, it's coming up again at the end of July. Um, I think everyone's in, in Congress uh, and the Senate and the House have agreed on what they want. Um, there's an affordability component that will help people who can't afford their flood insurance, you know, it, it, as determined by their income. Uh, they're going to have some subsidies applied to their flood policies, and that's going to be very helpful. Um, I think there's going to be more information shared. Uh, FEMA sharing information with the private market to enable private market to get, use that information to essentially compete against FEMA. We're seeing that happen today. Uh, and competition's a good thing because it lowers prices for everyone. Um, and FEMA, I, I've heard, may make insuring businesses optional. So um, that'll be interesting to see if they allow that. And why that change? Is there, is there a method to that or a thinking behind it? You know, I think it's uh, businesses, I guess, have more a assets, and it, it would just become up to them whether or not they want to insure their building for the risk of flood. Um, I don't know how that'll bear out with the mortgages companies. If they have a mortgage, the mortgages companies may still require that flood insurance. So that's, that's one thing. And I think there's some also some talk of increasing the limits available for homes. Today, it's the maximum you can buy from FEMA is 250000 You know, and if you have a $750,000 house, you have to buy what's called an excess policy. And there's some talk that FEMA may allow you to buy more coverage within the FEMA umbrella. And do we find that in this very partisan, divided day where politicians don't agree on anything, that there does seem to be, I mean, especially locally, but even nationally, you know, agreement on, on you know, the, the National Flood Insurance Program and, and the importance of, you know, insurance and elevation yes. of FEMA. And, I mean, is that safe to say? Yeah, I think there's a lot of agreement. I think the, maybe the disagreement is, um, one, how fast rates should climb. We know rates are climbing. Um, FEMA wants the, the cost of insurance to essentially be a break-even program. So they want everyone to pay a true risk rate. So if your home is low to the ground, you have a higher risk of flooding, you would pay more money. Um, that Those premiums are climbing, and some people think they should climb at a slower rate. Um, the other kind of point of contention is how much money FEMA should uh, give away to help people mitigate that risk. So if you're low to the ground, today FEMA gives you 30000 after severe damage. There's talk maybe it should be 50000 maybe it should be 100000 so how much money should FEMA be giving people who have had damage and want to fix their problem? Are, are rates expected to still climb? Then? They is are going to continue. general forecast? What, how quickly is still up in the year, but the, but the rates will continue to climb? Yeah, and they're climbing essentially the most for the older homes. The homes built before 1231-74. Okay. Uh, that's called a pre-firm policy. Pre-firm, meaning flood insurance rate map. Back in those days, there was really no requirement to elevate your home. You could build it on the ground. And then uh, in January 175, 
town started adopting FEMA maps and started building homes higher off the ground. So the older homes may or may not be elevated properly. What we always tell our customers, and really anyone, get, a, get an elevation certificate. Spend the money. You're going to spend between $350, $400, and then you know exactly, number one, what your risk is of flood. Is if your home is in compliance, you're going to save a lot of money. You turn that elevation certificate in, and your insurance company is going to send you back uh, a refund. So it's well worth the, uh, and we had guests well on the it. past uh, whole shows on elevation certificates, yes. and it's something that's relatively inexpensive that in the long run is not going to cost you anything, Right. and, and it's a good thing to have for any coastal property. I would say eight out of ten people that spend the money will benefit in some way. You have two people out there that are going to spend the money and say, eh, it's not going to help. And they're going to be spending three, $400, but at the end of the day, it actually will help them when they sell their home. It makes their home more marketable when they know exactly what the risk is of, of, of flood. Good point. Um, let's just, uh, and I, I'm always late in doing this, quickly saying hello to, uh, to some viewers out there on this Father's Day. Again, it's, uh, it's tough. It's a holiday, plus the weather's so nice. But Beautiful. appreciate you guys also joining us. Um, uh, Melissa Garzone, where is Palma? Palma, again, under the weather today. We'll just generically uh, leave it at that without invading her privacy. I believe she's watching. I thought I saw her on there. And of course she's going to watch. She's, she's not going to miss anything. Um, and she'll be back here forecasting. She'll be back here next Sunday. Um, um, and uh, can't wait to have her back. So not the same without her. No, it is not. But she actually has like a 3-0 lead on me in terms of she had perfect attendance and I had missed three <laughs> shows. So I'm kind of excited that I'm at least uh, she's catching, catching up. up to me now. Yes. But she still has two uh, get out of jail free cards there. Um, let's see. I uh, and Palma is indeed on. So we hope Palma's uh, feeling better. Uh, Amy Cope, nice to have you on. Um, Irene Parker, uh, Amy, happy uh, Father's Day to Roger. Um, uh, so Irene Parker says hello. Eric Walters, uh, Stephanie Belfield, uh, nice to have you guys on too. Uh, a lot of hellos, not too many questions today, uh, which is fine, which means you did yeah. such a good job in your... Um, and you're con conversing so far today that you left our audience with no questions. <laughs> Speechless. We, 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 we expect nothing uh, less from Thomas Heiss. So that's, uh, that's exactly what we expect. Thank um, you, uh, Teresa Scheer, nice to have you on. Uh, Michelle Esposito, uh, Jennifer Gunning, uh, Matthew DiBiazzo, uh, weather question, how hot tomorrow? Uh, you'll have the sea breeze in Ocean City, so you're going to be like 80 to 85. No Great. tidal flooding. No tidal flooding in the forecast anytime soon. Uh, on the mainland, it's 90 to 95, heat index of 100. So it's going to be a, a hot day. I want to say a hot summer day, but it's not officially summer. It's not. Do you know when summer begins officially? June 21st. That's right, which is Thursday, 6.07 a.m. is the start of summer. That's a guess. That was a guess. That from, was a very good from guess. From grade school. Longest day of the year, too. I did not know that. Yeah, Fantastic. so it's coming up on uh, June 21st and 94 days of summer. Um, summer f is the minimum for tidal flooding in terms of huh. how often it occurs, but you can have poor drainage flooding from thunderstorms and, of course, the dreaded tropical systems, which there are none on the map right now. So, yeah. And we hope it's a quiet year, but it only takes one. Again, Tom Heiss has been our guest on this Father's Day. Um, now, Tom has um, uh, been a guest in the past and may already have one, but I believe my wife Amanda actually picked out uh, uh -huh. your collection of uh, Irish a, Pub. Uh, I love the there. Irish Pub shirt. Nice t-shirt for summer. That's a, I'm a big fan of the Irish Pub. If you have not been here, I would say come on down. It's a very fun place to be. The beer is delicious and uh, the people are friendly. So thank you very much. All right, thanks for having. Uh, yeah. Thanks for coming on this Father's Day. Tom, a father of three and took some time to come on out. All of this brought to you by the New Jersey Coastal Coalition, you know, working to spread awareness, yeah. education, coastal resiliency, um, and the Irish Pub, a proud sponsor of Tidal Flooding Talk as well. 7 p.m. every Sunday evening. Note the day changes. This is week two of Sunday. Palma will be back for week three uh, next week, and it'll be our first tidal flooding of summer. Fantastic. Officially of summer. Thanks, guys. Stay cool tomorrow, and hope to see you back here soon.